Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Versus. This time I'm going to be pitting the two best cargo haulers in the large category up against one another, and that's the Hull Sea and the Banu Merchantman. Both of these ships are very closely matched in a number of ways, and are both designed to excel at doing their job, but each seems to take a very different approach as to how they go about accomplishing it. The Hull Sea is produced by Muashi Industrial and Starflight Concern. This manufacturer has a reputation for constructing very efficient modular ships, and is the preferred brand for traders and large corporations alike. MISC is also the only human spacecraft corporation to have signed a Lend-Lease agreement with the Xi'an, and have already integrated some of their unique technology into the MISC lineup of ships. The Hull Sea is regarded as being the middle ground for the Hull series, it's also considered to be the most common ship in the galaxy. Amongst the rest of the Hull series, the sea is the most commonly produced and is considered to be the most versatile among them. It has three remote turret mounts that each can hold a pair of size 2 weapons on it, and a single turret mount that can hold a pair of size 3s. It has a max crew size of 4, but can be run at a minimal level with a crew of 2. So let's take a look at some of the pros for this ship. The Hull Sea is going to be extremely fuel efficient and prove to be a reliable ship to operate. It'll be coming stock with all industrial class components, so it's not going to be a high performance ship, but it quite literally is going to be built for the long haul. Another plus is that it can be run by an extremely small crew for the size of the ship and for the amount of cargo that it carries, which means that its overhead expenditures are going to be relatively cheap with regards to ship maintenance, fuel, and crew costs. Its unique design allows it to collapse the cargo struts when not in use, so that they can fold up as the two halves of the ship pull in together, which is going to allow it to land on any appropriately sized landing pad. So the ship isn't going to be reduced to just docking with space stations. At least, it only will when it's hauling cargo. Yet another plus for this ship is that its design is intended to hit that sweet spot between the smaller single-person transports and the massive super freighters like the Hull D and the Hull E. The Hull Sea offers the expansive modularity of these larger ships, while still retaining some of the maneuverability that the lower end range of the Hull ships have. The single biggest distinguishing quality of this ship is its massive cargo hauling capacity. This is due to the fact that it stores its cargo externally on struts that extends out well past the exterior of the ship's hull. There are some downsides to this, but the upside is that for a ship of its size, it can hold 4,608 SCUs worth of cargo. As stated before, the Hull Sea is considered to be the most common ship in the verse, which has good and bad connotations to it. The good aspect of this is that being so common, it should be relatively easy to acquire in-game, and if its presence has saturated the market, it should also be relatively inexpensive when compared to the other large cargo haulers. One last advantage to the Hull Sea is the standalone pledge price of the ship. It goes for $250, while the current price for the Banu is $350. So this ship manages to cut overhead costs both in-game and in the real world by delivering more and costing less all the way around. The negatives for this ship in a lot of ways are just extensions of its good qualities. MISC is generally known for specializing their ships to be singular of purpose, and that specialization comes usually at the expense of nearly everything else. This includes maneuverability, defense, and onboard amenities. Although the Hull C is going to be more maneuverable than a Hull D or an E, it's still going to be far less maneuverable than other large ships, and even less so when it's fully loaded with cargo. It's designed to be able to land, but it's not going to be able to when it's carrying cargo. That means that your trade routes are going to be restricted to only space stations or other kinds of space-bound facilities. Also, the lack of wings and its distinctly non-aerodynamic design means that it's not going to handle well within an atmosphere, which in turn could further restrict the number of planets or moons that it could visit. You might be able to land, but you're not going to be able to leave again, at least not without the help of something like an SRV to tow you back into space. This ship is going to be heavily reliant on fighter escorts for protection, which is going to cut into its profit margin and limit the distances that it can travel in a single jump. You could travel alone, but without an escort, this ship is going to be ill-equipped to handle any kind of trouble that it's going to be running across. 
As far as amenities go, a safe assumption is that it'll provide basic accommodations for its maximum size crew, which means four bunks, one bathroom, and some kind of centralized dining area. Misk isn't known for comfort, or extravagance. It's known for getting the job done. You can look to the other ships in the Misk lineup to use as an example to go by to give you a good idea of what the inside of the Hull Sea is going to look like. Design-wise, it's already heavily relying on the 60-40 rule, where 60% of the ship is going to come from the Starfarer and Freelancer's list of available assets, with 40% of its design being bespoke to the Hull series. The rest of its negatives I'm going to be talking about, oddly enough, are all connected to its most positive feature, and that's the storage of its cargo externally. Storing its cargo in this way is going to allow it to have a huge advantage with regards to the amount that it can carry, but this also poses some additional problems. First is an issue that was brought up by the Kraken, which, surprisingly enough, its shields are not going to extend and cover the ships that are located on its external landing pads. This was huge news and sets a precedence that may carry over to the Hull series as well. In the 3.6 update, the Legacy Shield system is going to be replaced with a new Sign Distance Field tech, which is going to be more form-fitting to the ship and less of a bubble design like the Legacy Shielding is. So it's quite possible that the ship's shields will not cover or protect the externally mounted cargo. This would be huge if it didn't. That would leave your cargo completely exposed to potential damage from the stray shots of attacking pirates, or even just griefers who wanted to destroy your goods for the fun of it. That's not even the biggest concern that I have with the Hull C. The biggest concern I have with the Hull C stems from the fact that it is going to be the most common ship in the verse. It's also going to be a vital aspect in constructing the game's dynamic economy, which is going to be driven by a series of AI-run Hull Cs that travel between the landing zones and space stations delivering goods like some kind of over-bloated, geon-infused interstellar Santa Claus. All of these things mean that this is going to be the ship that's most often targeted by pirates. So nearly every pirate from the advanced to the novice alike are all going to be experienced at taking down a hull sea. Since it'll be run by an AI crew, being so easy to come across and so full of cargo, it's going to be the ship of choice for them to attack. And that's what worries me that I'll be flying a ship that nearly every pirate in the galaxy has previously jacked a dozen times over, and already has extensive experience at disabling, boarding, and taking it over. That brings me to the contender in this heavyweight matchup, and that's the Banu Merchantman. The Merchantman's ships have been passed down from one generation of Banu to another, and a great deal of care has been put into their maintenance and upkeep. This is the ship that the Banu are best known for, and this sturdy, dedicated trading ship has been prized throughout the galaxy beyond all other transports. For defense, this ship has four size 6 weapon hardpoints and a remote turret that can hold an additional pair of size 5 guns. It requires a maximum size crew of 8 to fully run it, but can also be operated by a skeleton crew of 4 people. This ship is already as big as the Polaris, and may become even bigger after its production cycle is finally done with. The advantages that the Merchantman presents comes from its components, maneuverability, the way it stores its cargo, the interior of its ship, defense, and the extra gameplay options that it presents. When it comes to components, the Merchantman and the Hull Sea both carry the same size and number of components. With the exception that the Merchantman has one more additional large power plant than the Hull Sea has. But the Banu are known for taking the most choice items that they can acquire from other races, and trade with everyone including the Vanduul. So this ship will represent the best that the entirety of the verse has to offer with regards to its components, which includes its weapons, engines, and jump drives. The Defender already by default comes with Xi'an constructed engines and Tavaran shields, and I expect no less to be put into the Merchantman, which is the ship that the Banu are best known for. When it comes to maneuverability, the Merchantman, unlike the Hull Sea, can still land on the surface of a planet while fully laden down with cargo. This means that you'll have a lot more opportunities open to you to be able to visit and trade at. The wings and VTOL thrusters are also going to make it more maneuverable while traveling within an atmosphere. And its overall maneuverability has been described as being well above the curve for a ship of its size. When it comes to design, the inside of the Merchantman is going to have a more organic, crafted feel to it. There's even hints of gemstone that have been integrated into the detailing of the walls and floor that are used to accent the light as it reflects off their surface. The ship is not only big on the outside, it's also going to be big on the inside as well. 
having been built for members of the Banu race that are a lot taller than your average human. So the interior will feel a lot more spacious than you'd normally be accustomed to, especially in comparison to most human ships. The Banu themselves are known for coming off as aloof and not being highly approachable. So to compensate for this, they've made the ship as ornate and as comfortable feeling as possible. This intention can be seen in the negotiation room, which is designed to put people at ease as much as it's meant to impress visitors. The Banu also travel with all of their most precious acquisitions and proudly put them on display for all to see as a sign of their accomplishments. So if the design team adheres to the lore of this ship, it should have by default a lot of open area for placing and displaying your personal items. And since this ship was meant to act as a permanent home for the captain and crew, it should also have a lot of extra storage for your equipment and items within it as well. The Banu as a culture do not have a notion of fine art, at least not in the way that humans understand it to be, and instead they place that creative energy into the utilitarian things that they construct, such as in the architecture of their cities and even in the ships that they build. That's why their ships are so ornate on the inside, and are presented with a sense of artistry that's not commonly found among other shipbuilders. That's because the Banu vessels represent who they are as a people as much as it provides a utilitarian function for them. To the Banu, this isn't just a ship. It's also their home and an extension of their status. For defense, the Merchantman has a rather impressive assortment of onboard weapons. This makes it less risky for the ship if it chooses to fly without an escort. And when flying with an escort, it can support them by using its heavy guns to barrage the enemy with artillery fire, and help finish the attackers off, or to directly engage any larger ships that are also attacking. The Banu Defender was specifically created to act as an escort ship for the Merchantman, and by design their abilities should complement one another. The Merchantman's guns also have the ability to retract within the ship when not in use, which is good not only for their protection, but to also help keep a low profile when traveling within a secure sector of space. The Merchantman has kind of a dual role when it comes to cargo hauling, and presents more gameplay choices for the player to indulge in. Instead of being relegated to simply heading to an LZ and selling off your goods, you're also presented with a second option. And this option is to dock up with a space station and setting off a beacon stating that your ship is open for business for people to come aboard and purchase items directly from you. At first this held no interest for me at all, but the more I thought about it, the more appealing this became. As we've already seen with the current economy, places can have ceilings as to how much they'll buy of a certain item. That is, if they're willing to buy it at all. Prices fluctuate, and demands change. Sometimes even between the time that it takes for you to leave one port and arrive at the other. Now imagine that you could dock up with a space station, leave one of your crew in charge, and be able to sell off your goods while you go off and explore. There are some obvious issues and concerns with regards to the security of your ship, which the devs have some interesting ideas about. But I feel that having options to work with rather than just being held to only doing traditional forms of trade is a rather intriguing thing to have access to, and potentially could be a lot more interesting than I originally gave it credit for. And there's another layer to this that was discussed, where you could possibly rent out kiosk space within your ship to freelance vendors who would be selling to people from their own stock of goods, and would give you a percentage of their profits. And as your reputation grows, you'll attract better shops with higher quality merchandise to sell which would translate into increased amounts of revenue for you. Lastly, the Banu Merchantman can store 3,584 SCUs worth of cargo, which is the largest amount of internal storage that you're going to find outside of a capital-class vessel. Storing your cargo in this way presents a number of benefits over storing it externally. For instance, there may be some controversy as to whether or not a ship's shielding will protect the externally stored cargo. Well, the Merchantman's shields are definitely going to keep it safe as well as the ship's armor and additional locking mechanisms, which will not only protect it from damage, but theft as well. You'll be able to tell from a glance whether a whole sea is full of cargo or not, while the only way to determine if a merchantman is fully loaded is going to be by scanning it, and there's going to be ways around that. There are several cons associated with this ship that I'm about to go over. When it comes to maneuverability, in its original design dock, the Merchantman was referred to as being a blockade runner. This was later clarified by the designers, who described it as being a relatively slow ship, 
but would handle a lot better than the other ships that have a similar mass and fit into the same size classification. So it's not going to be a blockade runner in the way that most people were thinking. It might be faster in a straight line, and may accelerate up to that top speed quicker than other large ships, but it isn't going to be performing at the level that some people were expecting it to. Another potential downside to this ship is the size of the crew that's needed to keep it functioning. The Merchantman is going to require double the maximum size crew as the whole sea just to run it at a minimal level, and quadruple its number to fully carry out all the functions of the ship. So in order to be operating at peak efficiency, you're either going to have to invest in hiring an AI crew, or be reliant on friends to help you fly this ship. Also, opening up your ship to the general public in order to sell your goods presents a shopping cart list of potential edge cases with regards to the security of your ship. Most of the details involving this are still being worked out, but you can bet that it'll go through some rough patches where they iron all the kinks out of it and eliminate obvious exploits that are sure to arise. And just because this ship has stronger offensive abilities than the whole sea, that still doesn't mean that it can go without a fighter escort. So this ship is also going to be restricted in its jump distances and range based on the types of ships that are going to be traveling with it. And regardless if you're talking about a hull sea or the merchantman, a fleet of ships are only going to be as fast as the slowest vessel. So in conclusion, like with a lot of these comparisons, the best ship for you is going to depend on what your needs are and what your style of gameplay is going to be. The whole series is myopically focused on cargo hauling at the expense of all other things, including defense, maneuverability, speed, and onboard amenities. But it's going to be better at doing its job than any other ship within a size classification. That is if your only criteria for doing a good job is based on how much cargo you can haul with it. But you have to ask yourself, is this single-minded approach to performing this task worth everything else that it gives up in the process? For some people, the answer to that is yes. It will also be the only kind of design decision for this type of ship that makes any sense. The whole sea is going to be the perfect ship for people who are planning on taking a no-nonsense approach to their cargo hauling, and want to get the most out of every one of the trips that they take. After all, the 1024 extra SEUs isn't a little difference. It's like being able to carry an additional Carex worth of cargo during each haul, and over time that's going to add up to a lot of extra credits per run. This is also going to be a more desirable ship for people who are only planning on flying with one other person, or only wants to invest in hiring the least amount of AI crew members as possible to keep the overhead costs down. It's a min-maxing cargo hauler at its finest. The Merchant Man sacrifices some of the hauling capacity of the Hull Sea, but it gains so much more in terms of options. It's heavily defended, making it less reliant on escort ships, has the ability to store its cargo internally, it has more opportunities open to it as far as where it can trade at, it handles much better within an atmosphere, it can land while hauling cargo, it has a much more interesting and spacious interior to make long trips more enjoyable, it can also act as a mobile bazaar which presents a whole new aspect of gameplay to help keep things interesting. All these things make the Merchant Man a better choice for people who are looking to get more of a social experience from their cargo hauling, who value the aesthetics that a finely crafted alien ship brings, who wants to see more of the universe using this ship, and who may wish also to indulge in the potential to roleplay that this ship offers, from the spacious interior, the in-ship bazaar, and its ornate negotiation room. The Merchant Man is going to be all about options, while the whole sea is going to be very straightforward with its approach to cargo hauling. And it's going to be up to you to decide which one of these two features you value the most. Well, that's going to be it for this episode of Versus. I've been your host, Law of the West. Thanks for watching, and take care.